Shapiro, thanks so much for coming on to talk about your mom, Eartha Kitt. And your name is Kitt, and we've established that it was Eartha Kitt and Kitt. And why did she name you Kitt? Well, I always said it was so that she wouldn't forget my name, but How could I she actually... forget that? <laughs> You're her only child. <laughs> I was going to be Kit whether I was a boy or a girl, so there really? wasn't much thought process here. I don't know what would have happened if she'd had more than one child. I would have been like the George Foreman of, of <laughs> girls, maybe. Um, but she used to often introduce us. We'd go to places and she'd say, I'm Eartha and this is Kit, as if I completed her somehow. Would it get a laugh or would people... People, I think... Well, they thought it was cute. They, of uh -huh. course, then thought my name was Kit Kit, but my mother's married name was McDonald. She just didn't use it. She used, you know, her, her maiden name in, as a stage name. So they got confused, but, but that, you know, people thought it was very cute. People called me Kit Kit or, you know, Little Kit. Um, but she really, you know, she didn't have any family. So to give me her name was really important to her. She wanted her name to continue. Let's talk about, and we're looking at a picture of you and your mom. Let's go back to your mom's childhood, and it was not a very happy childhood in the South. So tell me a little bit so that we can sort of build a foundation about then she became this international star. Right. So what happened right. in her childhood? She was born in a small town called North South Carolina, and she was, um, her mother she knew very, not for, for a very brief moment because her mother left early and, and gave her up and then died very early on. And of course that caused scars. Yes. She was given up by her mother, didn't know her father. Didn't know her father. It was assumed that her father was, was white because my mother was lighter skinned than everybody else around her, which was not easily accepted in the South. And she was born in 1927. And so she was often referred to as a yellow gal. And people didn't want you to be, they wouldn't have her. They didn't want to ha because take her in. She didn't fit in. Because she didn't that. fit in. She didn't fit in, so they would. She was. She heard a lot. Yeah, I won't have that yellow gal in my house, and because she was also illegitimate, so, so she had a lot of stigma attached to this little tiny thing. That you know, she didn't speak very much. She was so scared of of people because they treated her so badly. Um, so she really had a tough time. Her mother then died after she'd given her away to a family who finally took her. The woman was blind. So she couldn't tell what color, what her color was. You couldn't make this up if you tried. No, no, it was. Um, so she grew up where? Uh, after she she was in the South for you know her early years and mis terribly mistreated by adults, by children, you know, beaten, abused, all the you know stereotypes that you hear. And an aunt lived in New York City, and somebody wrote to this aunt and said that if you don't get this child out of here, they're going to kill her. It's just, it's just, you know, she's like a, a toy to them, but, a, you know, an abusive toy. Um, so the, the aunt sent for her to come to New York, and my mother then came up to Harlem. She'd never seen a train, uh, elevated trains. She'd never seen indoor plumbing. She'd never seen, you know, it was like right out of the story. They dressed her in every piece of clothing she had. They put her on the train with little, she would say these little um, sardine sandwiches with white bread. And, you know, she gets off the train, and, and this woman who was very tall and regal, and my mother's part Cherokee Indian, and this woman, had, the aunt, was very much uh, Cherokee looking. And my mother describes, I never, the, she died many, many years ago, so I never, I wasn't alive to meet her. And she took her to this apartment, and, and my mother had, had to go to the bathroom, so she asked, you know, she, I guess if she asked her, she, she realized she was uncomfortable, and she made her go into this room, which was basically a closet, and my mother didn't, she thought she was being punished. I mean, she'd never seen indoor plumbing, Ugh. she didn't know what to do. So she like sat there on the side of the bathtub for the I, longest I, I time. I can't imagine. <laughs> so the so, woman comes in and finally realizes that she didn't so know she, what to do. So she comes to New York mm -hmm. and is raised by her aunt. Mm -hmm. Then what happens? I mean, how does she end up being discovered what 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 happens well she would always dance around and play around you know she loved and she was five music foot two, right? Right. A little, she was little tiny you know really petite little thing and uh, one day she was walking down the street with a girlfriend and the, a, a young girl had a list of makeup that she came they asked she asked where's the makeup store I don't know what, what the store was and the, my mother said to her why do you have the whole list you're young, such a young girl what do you need all that makeup for and she said well I work uh, I work for Catherine Dunham who had the Catherine Dunham dance company at the time and she said Miss Dunham sent me out to get all of this makeup for her and so somehow a discussion came uh, around and 
my mother was dared by her friends to go audition for the dance company, and she did, and she won a scholarship, and she joined the company, and they went, started touring the country, the world, and that's where she was in Paris with the company when Orson Welles discovered her in Paris. And, and what happened there? Orson Welles cast her in his uh, production of Faust, and he was really, you know, he just, he adored her, but really, I mean, she, she was, she would say that she would go with him to dinner and just sit there and, and with all these unbelievably artistic people and just listen and soak it all up, and it was just, you know, she was like a sponge. So she starts to sing, she starts to act. Mm -hmm. it t why did she take off? What, what was it, because she was so different? I think because she was different. She had a voice that really nobody ha could identify. She was exotic. She had that, the sort of that Lena Horne-esque to her, where this regalness, but this incredible beauty. She had a presence. When she walked into a room, as tiny as she was, people would, were shocked. They would think that she, you know, when they would stand next to her, they said, I can't believe how, how tiny you are. You know, I would have thought you were 5'10 or 5'9. Um, she had a, a sense of self that I think that just sort of radiated. That she had to find herself because she certainly wasn't given that as no, a child. No, no, but I think her instincts were, you know, her, her given name was Eartha, and she truly was of the earth, and she truly was connected to the universe and the spiritual world and the environment. You know, she was, you know, it was all about the earth to her, water and taking care of the earth and growing your own food. I mean, that's what she learned in the South, but she carried that throughout her entire life. So I think that, even, you know, what she, she came into this world born connected to everything around her and a part of it. And she really was always true to herself. Whenever she made a decision, she listened to her gut, always did. And the t few times that she didn't, she would say, that's because I didn't, you know, I second-guessed myself or I listened to somebody else. We have some pictures of your mom with a lot of stars. Yes. Marilyn Monroe, mm -hmm. Sidney Poitier, mm -hmm. Sammy Davis Jr., the Queen of England. Do, do you remember her talking to you about what it was like to meet the Queen of England coming from her meager beginnings? You know, she, I think my mother was just very curious and she wanted, to, she would ask, she wanted to meet Albert Einstein. And so she asked her agents to, you know, set up a meeting and they was like, Albert Einstein's not going to meet with you, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. So she said, ask him. And they did and he said yes. And so she went to Princeton and sat with him for, you know, hours. You know, I was telling the, the kids, that my, my, my children, the, I, one day when they, we found a picture, a, a menu from Winston Churchill, a, a luncheon that my mother went to with him and his wife, and he signed it, and his wife signed it, and there's a picture of, with Winston Churchill and my mother, and I said to them, I said, I bet you that none of your friends can say that their grandmother was no. at lunch with Winston <laughs> Churchill. Can you even imagine? So she becomes this star, and we all know her from Santa Baby, mm -hmm. and we all know her as Catwoman from the Batman movie. And I said to you before we started, people want to know where the, where the purr came from. And you ascertained it, but it was before she was a big star she yes. started this? Yes. I, she started, well, she, when she went to Paris, she learned how to speak French, the, this, obviously. This is the picture of her as Catwoman. And Catwoman, that's right. She was really the quintessential Catwoman. The irony was she only did, you know, I think maybe four episodes. But people associate her oh, yes. with that character. From the 60s. Yes, yes. She said that she learned the purr um, from just practicing vocal exercises in, in, the, ba you know, in the bathroom. And, and then from learning different languages, because she would speak and sing in different, in Turkish and Japanese and Spanish German. And How did she do all of that? All these different languages. I mean, she grabbed on to life. Yes. Once it became in, in front of her mm -hmm. and, and just didn't let go, it seems to me. She learned, she took, took it in. Went and she gusto. truly believed, it. when I would travel with her, and, and I did, she, she you took managed me, your career for 20 Yes, years, I worked 25? for Eartha Kit Productions and, and 
produced her tours and her, her albums and her, a lot of her shows. And, but as a little girl, she took me all around the world with her because she felt that education was, travel was the best education you could possibly have. You couldn't learn any of this in books. Let's talk about apartheid in South Africa when you went with your mom. What yes. happened? Because this, this is an important story. Yes. People need to so hear. I grew up very sophisticated and traveling. We lived in London, we lived in Los Angeles, and I went to French schools. So I was very sophisticated. We went to, to South Africa in 1974, which was during apartheid, which was not well uh, received by a lot of people because they felt that my mother was not being true to, you know, to, to standing for what was right and wrong. And my mm -hmm. mother felt that artists were the true diplomats because they don't have to use all the protocol and be politically correct. They can go and they can make change. They can work outside the boundaries of whatever the State Department or the, you know, the politicians have to. So when we, so she agreed to go to South Africa, but she also made a um, statement that she would only perform for integrated audiences, which of course was not how South no. Africa operated at the time. And while we were there, she also wanted to raise money to build schools for African children. So we went, and I was 13 years old. It's not like I was you know, a little tiny thing. I was old enough to, to know the, what was going on and understand how things worked. Um, but what was really interesting, it was the first time I realized that my mother and I were different. Now, we were there as VIPs, and my mother was able to go anywhere, as was I. Had we been born there, and resident, you know, uh, from the, the country, we would not have been. I would have been considered colored, even though I was passive, you know, my color is, is white Even though you look enough, white, but, yes. And my mother would also have been considered colored, which was sort of one step better, <laughs> better off than, than the African, the black Africans, but not as good as, you know, the Africans, who are the, the white mm -hmm. Africans. Um, so I went one, one evening to watch, to see Margot Fontaine. I was a ballet dancer and I loved Margot Fontaine. So I went to see her dance um, Swan Lake with friends of my mother's. And we're in this big opera house in Cape Town and people are, are whispering this big gala. And my mother was not there. My mother's performing. And they're like, oh, that's Eartha Kitt's daughter. That's Eartha Kitt's daughter. And yeah, I'm 13 years old. I'm thinking, wow, I'm really important. People actually know who I am. That's pretty <laughs> cool. The next day, I found my, my mother proudly stated that the reason people were saying all that was because it was a whites only theater. And technically, I wouldn't have been allowed to be there. So I was breaking the law. That's why people were talking that, you know, that. that Did it's that unfair. hurt you as you were sophisticated, but you're only 12 or 13. Did you understand really what was going on that, that you may, may be a little bit better than your mom because you were lighter skinned? I mean, what, what, what were the mixed messages going on there? You know, I don't really think at the time I understood that because my mother wasn't with me at that theater, so we, she wasn't being treated mm -hmm. differently. Later on that same trip, we were at an amusement park. I traveled with a tutor whenever we went on the road, and my tutor and I, was, he was British, we would go to this amusement park in Durham, in South Carolina, I mean South Africa, and um, we went every day. And I kept saying to my mother, "You've got to come to this music park. It's so much fun. The bumper cars and the this." And she had rehearsals and press conferences. And so one day, finally, as to, towards the end of our stay, she said, "Okay, I'll go with you." So she came, and we were on the bumper cars, and the bumper cars stopped all of a sudden. And somebody who worked there came over, and he said to my mother, "Excuse me, ma'am, are you European?" And she said, no, I'm American. And he said, no, no, that's, that's not what I mean. I mean, are you colored? And she looked at her skin and she said, well, I guess if this, you consider this colored, then I'm colored. And he said, well, this is a whites only park, so you're not allowed to be here. So my mother calmly stood up and started to leave the park. And I am screaming like a, you know, a typical teenager, don't you tell him you were, you know, tell him who you are. Tell him that you can be here. We have VIP status. You can go anywhere you want. You don't have to, you don't have to live by the rules of the country. You're, it's different. You're not the same. And she would say to me, don't panic, which is on, which is on your wrist. <laughs> don't panic. Everything happens for a reason. God may not be there when you want him, but he's always on time. And she very calmly left. And she didn't say anything the rest of the day. 
I, of course, was pouting and crying and you know throwing a tantrum. And the two days later, she was in a pre having a press conference, and the photographers asked to have a, her take a picture overlooking the amusement park. And she said, "Oh, you know, it's very funny. I was thrown out of that park the other day." Well, headlines. The headlines, and the owner of the park was so apologetic and so, you know, he said, "What can I do to make it up to you? You know, anything you want." And she said, "Well, you know, we're building these schools, so you know, for the for African children, your donation would be really <laughs> welcome." So he wrote a check, and he gave us, you know, tickets to go to the amusement park. And so my my mother went back. She brought two white children and two black children and two colored children. And that was how, you know, she was not one to stand up on a soapbox and, and scream and yell and, and make a big scene, which is how I would have done it, <laughs> I think. She was one to, who makes change in very subtle ways, but yet it was very loud in its, in, her, in its subtlety. You brought in some goodies, I think, yes. some writings. Um, on hotel stationery and in books, are there? F there are obviously favorite sayings, and, and you have started to develop a business now called Simply Eartha yes. and the Kit Isms. Right. Did some of these Kit Isms, her sayings like "Don't panic," and other things, are there favorites? Well, my mother had. She coined them Kit Isms during her life because. And none of she didn't make any of these up. These are not necessarily, you know, unique to her. But once she said them, they were hers. And that's <laughs> they don't even try to tell her differently. That was they were a kidism, and a kidism was a kidism. And she would write everything down. And um, when she died, which is now four and a half years ago, of colon cancer. Of colon cancer, yes, a, a, an unnecessary cancer to die from. Um, I found. Through all of her, all of her belongings, pieces of paper. You, you see, you have writings on everything, from post-it notes to hotel stationery and how to special napkins, is that, and that you have. That. And my mother said to me before she died, "Don't throw anything away. <laughs> Don't throw it away. Everything I have done is for you. It's going to be used somehow. It's going to be able to be used someday. So don't throw it away." So, I, of course, I was terrified to throw it away. But what do you do with all these pieces of paper? So, um, after she died, two years after she died, I decided to, to do a book, a little book for her, for close friends of ours, of my mother's and of who touched our lives. And so I took some of her kidisms, and in her own handwriting even, then I, and I made it just did on my computer, on my and own. And the cover Santa Baby. And the cover was this uh, one of Santa Baby. Which you're not getting the royalties from. Well, I'm getting her vocal, yes, I do get her vocal royalties. Oh, good. But not, uh, yes, yeah, she didn't own the, she didn't compose it. So, good. but so I you're do get, something. yes. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so I've, so she's, we've put in all these kid, kidisms, some fabulous pictures that I have, and kidisms, and people really responded to them. So on our Facebook page, which we have Facebook, the Eartha Kit. Uh, I started to post a lot of these, which I had pictures of a few minutes ago, um, and the fans really respond to them. So then I'm thinking, well, now wait a minute. I own, you know, I have her handwriting, which is her philosophy, her, her, her spirit. I also have some images that are unique that nobody else has. So was, I'm going to maybe combine those, and, and people seem to really like them. So I've decided to, with Simply Eartha, Dot com. Dot com. <laughs> we have uh, her pieces of home decor items. Pillows and, pillows, and blankets. Blankets, mugs, um, And made arts. in the USA. You said that well, was Well, my mother important. was very much made in the USA. If you gave her something that was made in China or made overseas, she would give it back to you. So she was very, she was green before it was chic and trendy to be green. We had a vegetable garden and chickens in our house in Beverly in, in Hills. Beverly Hills. She truly believed that if it, if it didn't come from the earth, you didn't eat it. And if it was processed, it wasn't good, it wasn't good to eat. So that's how, that's how she lived. She said it has to be, anything that she buys would preferably be made in the USA. Not so easy to, to find all the time. But I knew that if I was going to be designing and, and making items, if I didn't have it all made in the United States, that somehow she was going to come, I was going to hear from her. <laughs> <laughs> Something was coming out. So what are you doing with your company, Simply Eartha? What, uh, there's a give back piece to this yes, company. Yes, the give back piece is to uh, the Colon Cancer Alliance because colon cancer is the second largest killer of cancers 
uh, in the United States, which most people don't realize. I think they assume it's breast cancer and, and maybe other types. Lung cancer is number one and colon cancer is number two. And it is the easiest to have a colonoscopy. To find and to treat. And you know, when you have a colonoscopy, if they find a polyp, they literally, during the procedure, they remove it and it's done. And it doesn't develop into anything more than that. So it's really an unfortunate, you know, my mother was always healthy, so she didn't go to the doctor because she didn't have to. So she didn't have to. She was to bigger than life, she thought, right? Yeah, she was. So you have the company that, that you're going to expand and get her kit isms out there and mm -hmm. some other things. What do you miss most about your mom and who she was? Well, I miss her her centeredness. Her, her there was that that peace that she had. That that sort of she wasn't easily flustered, you know. So she was always you knew that if she was in the room that there was you know sort of a solid an anchor. <laughs> um, I also miss. Her, I mean, I was her absolute be all and end all. I mean, there's, there's just no doubt about that. Because dad wasn't around. Right. My, my parents divorced very, very young, uh, when I was very, very young. And um, it was just my mother and I. And, you know. This picture is gorgeous that we that, just saw. Oh, and with us at the window. Um, what do I miss? I miss her laughing at all my jokes. My children don't laugh at any of my jokes. They, think I'm, <laughs> they don't think I'm funny at all. My mother thought I was hysterical. She thought it was the greatest thing that was, you know, ever invented. <laughs> and did she impart anything to you about Hollywood? Was it good to her? Had she had it by the time she retired? Because she, she sang for a long time and toured. Right. She worked up until, I mean, she died Christmas Day, 2008. Her last concert was with the Virginia Symphony, September 2008. So it was only two months prior to her death. And she... 90-minute concert she gave, you know, with the symphony orchestra. Um, she really felt that her fans were what had kept her alive. She, she loved her fans. To her, it wasn't about owning, you know, big important pieces of art or, or jewelry or anything fancy. To her, it was the pieces that her fans had given her, that had made for her or sent her. She kept everything, everything. And she could then tell you who gave it to her, where it was, you know, with the story behind it. In some ways, they were her family. Yeah, they were her family. They were her, they were the ones who stood by her and supported her in the times when, you know, she wasn't sure where her next meal was coming from. Kit Shapiro, thanks so much for coming on and imparting well, some welcome. of the Kit-isms and all the wonderful things that you're Thank doing you. for colon cancer through your mom. Thank you. Thanks again. Appreciate it.